we poured every penny we had into the business, which wasn't much, it was every penny of savings that we had. And I just thought, you know, if we create a product that actually works, like that really truly works, it's just gonna sell, right? And uh, and I think, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have had this experience where you're like, it's so good, why isn't it selling? <laughs> Hey Founder Fam, today's guest is Jamie Kern Lima. She's the co-founder of It Cosmetics, which is a company she started in her living room and then sold to L'Oreal for $1.2 billion in cash. Becoming the first female CEO in L'Oreal's 108 year history, she's here to tell us about her incredible journey of building an enormous brand with real purpose. Please welcome to the podcast, Jamie Kern Lima. So the first question we ask everyone that comes on is, how did you get your job? AKA, how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? You know, I always, since the time I was little, Nathan, I always sort of knew I would be an entrepreneur one day. I thought that, like I would, I would, you know, save candy that I would get at a holiday. And then I would think, how can I sell this? And so I always kind of had that inkling. Um, but then I actually thought growing up that I would do something totally different. I would sit in my living room and watch Oprah every day as a little girl. And I thought one day I'm gonna, I'm gonna share other people's stories with the world. And so, you know, growing up, I kind of had my sight set on that. And I did all kinds of jobs um, from waitressing at Denny's to pushing grocery carts in the, in the parking lot and, and uh, all those things, slicing meat in the deli. And I eventually landed in what I thought was my dream job. Uh, which was which was uh, anchoring television news and sharing people's stories with the world, and like so many entrepreneurs, um, I had a big problem happen that I, I couldn't solve, and I kind of had this big aha moment where I was like, oh my gosh, if there's hundreds of companies out there that that do this and none of them work for me, like what if I just try to figure it out? And so, um, you know. Now everyone sees, you know, It Cosmetics, the company that I started in my living room with, as this sort of like billion dollar brand. But, but how it really started was I was thinking I was in one dream job, um, thinking I would stay there forever on, on television news. And, and, uh, and I learned this big lesson that sometimes knowing when to go after a dream, um, or I should say when to let go of a dream matters as much as when to go after one. Um, and I was just, you know, I was anchoring the news every day and, and live on, on camera. And I developed a skin condition called rosacea. So for me, like my cheeks, my forehead, my nose, everything would get really, really red and bumpy. And so I started, you know, spending my whole paycheck on, on makeup products. And I, I tried everything out there from the most expensive stuff to the least expensive and, and nothing would work. And um, there was one moment, Nathan, uh, that was sort of the pivotal moment for me, which was, it was, I was live on, on air and all of a sudden I hear in my earpiece from the producer, um, there's something on your face. There's something on your face. You need to wipe it off. You need to wipe it off. And I'm, I'm live over the airways and, and I, I glanced down into my little compact mirror off the side and I knew what it was. It was, it was that the makeup was kind of breaking up almost the way, like if you imagine clay in a desert starts to crack, it was like cracking on my face and the redness, the bright red um, skin was coming through. And, and my producer had no idea what it was. He just thought like, wipe it off, get, you know, get it off. And, um, and I knew there was nothing I could wipe off. I, I kept trying to reapply makeup and it, it wasn't working. And so this sort of started, um, uh, you know, what I, what I thought was a season of setback in my life. I thought like, you know, am I going to get fired? Are viewers changing the channel? Because every single time I, I would go on the air live, um, it would happen, right? Because the hot HD lights would start to break up the makeup. And so I would, I would find myself in the same situation. And, and um, it was, uh, and then I realized like, okay, if I can't find anything <laughs> out there and there's hundreds of makeup companies, I can't find anything that works for me. There must be so many other people out there that maybe have just given up on makeup or feel like they've never found anything for them. And, and so, you know, for every person who is a founder or an entrepreneur listening right now, or maybe someone who hasn't taken the leap yet, but they're listening uh, and reading the founder because they know they want to one day. Um, I want to share that, you know, because this is really important. It's easy to see the outcome and the success story, but 
But for a long time, Nathan, I, I had this idea, like, you know, I, what if I launch my own company? What if I do it? And my gut told me I was supposed to do it. Like I couldn't shake that feeling, but for a long time, I didn't do it because my head was sort of talking me out of it. I would, I would think things like, oh, but you're not qualified and you don't have any money and you don't have any connections. And you know what I mean? And, and, and so many people I'm sure have already tried to do it. And, and if there's nothing that works, what makes you think you can? And just all of those thoughts that we tend to have. And I just, when I look back now, I am so glad I listened to my gut and went for it and took the big chance, even though it was much harder than I could have imagined. Because I think so often in, in life, our, our head tells, our, our gut's telling us one thing, but then our, our, our head is telling us another and, um, and our life comes down to which one we listen to. So. Yeah. Wow. What a crazy story. So can you tell me kind of, I'm just curious, how long did you have this idea in your head? Well, it was a couple of years cause I was just trying to find anything that would work. And, um, you know, one thing that happened that sort of put me over the edge um, that I think is really important just to share, especially with anyone out there who whatever phase they're at in their, their business or their entrepreneurial journey um, is early on, I had a blessing that I look back now and go, thank goodness that happened. And it's really what put me over the edge to, to really launch this thing and go for it. And, you know, we hear so many amazing thought leaders talk about your why and identifying the why of your, your business and your brand and your mission. And what I know now, cause I've, I've now had the, the gift of just meeting tens of thousands of entrepreneurs over the years. And a lot of people, I think they think their why is strong enough, but they haven't actually done the work to peel back the layers and like go deeper and get to the why beneath the why that's so powerful that they can lean on it when the times are super tough and they're tempted to quit. And when I look back at this moment after having this idea for a couple of years, one thing that, that happened so, I guess, serendipitously um, or out of sheer grace, I should say, is that, you know, initially I thought like, oh, okay, I can just create a makeup product that if it works for me, it'll probably work for so many other people. So my why could have very easily been like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll solve my own problems, but I'll help so many other people too. And I think a why like that is why so many entrepreneurs fail. And here's what I mean by that. <laughs> because when we share a why like that with someone else, they're like, that's great. That's so virtuous. That's awesome. And then we think it's enough. We think it's enough. If we have a why that I'm going to help people or this or that, because, you know, I did want to help people, but what happened, and, and I want to, I want to call this out for anyone listening, because I think this is really important. Challenge yourself, whatever you, you believe your, your mission or your, your, your personal why is for, for your own company. And this isn't something that has to be part of your mission statement. I'm more talking about as a founder, your personal why for why you're doing what you're doing, or perhaps why you have a big goal. Um, that you're working on is take your why, but then literally go deeper, like peel, peel, peel back the layers and try to go deeper to the deep why beneath the why. And in my case, what happened is I realized like at this one moment, and this is what put me over the edge to launch everything was like, I was like, I don't understand. This makes no sense that there are so many companies. Why do none of them work for me? And then what I realized was like, wait, I've actually never seen a model who has like bright red rosacea selling makeup products, right? And then I started thinking about growing up as, as a little girl. And what I realized is every time I would see the beauty ads on, on television or in magazines, like I love them. I aspired to, you know, look like them. But at a real deep level, they always made me feel like I wasn't enough. And I had this big moment where I realized like, okay, I want to launch products that work, but what if, what if when I launch a beauty company, what if I can actually put, you know, use real people as models and, and like all different ages and shapes and sizes and skin tones and skin challenges and, and call them beautiful and, and mean it. And what if I could actually like, like shift the definition of beauty inside the entire industry um, for every little girl out there who's about to start doubting herself and, and every grown person who still does. And it was kind of this huge, crazy idea for someone that was sitting there 
with no money, no connections, not sure how it was even going to happen. But I got that deep, deep, deep why that was so not just painful, but really meaningful, purposeful for me. Um, and that came early on. And, you know, after I, I jumped into entrepreneurship and, you know, <laughs> poured every penny I had into it, I didn't know it would be three years before I could even afford to pay myself at all. I didn't know that I would get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of no's. And I think that as founders, as entrepreneurs, as people with big dreams on our heart, we need like a toolbox of things we can pull from that help us maintain our resiliency. And, and, and for me, I think one of those real important tools was, was, was really that, that deep, 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 meaningful why where I realized, okay, what I'm doing is bigger than myself. It's not just about me. Right. And, and the last thing I'll say to this really quickly, because I think sometimes people think their why has to be some like global grandiose, you know, thing. Sometimes your why, your deep why may have nothing to do with your actual company, but your deep why may be like, I'm going to be the first person in generations of my family to break a cycle of poverty or of lack, or I'm going to be the first person that, you know, um, uh, goes for it and doesn't let self-doubt hold me back in my entire family, right? It could be, there's deep whys, or I want to show my children what it looks like to go after a dream. There's a lot of different whys beneath the why, but I think identifying one of those that really truly hits home is such a key because being a founder or an entrepreneur at any stage, right? I've, I've kind of seen a lot of different stages from <laughs> no money, no one believes in you, you're about to go bankrupt for a few years to you know, private equity investment and massive growth to, we built to over a thousand employees. Um, and when we eventually were acquired by L'Oreal, it was, it was our largest acquisition in the US in their history. Um, and then I was part of the largest beauty company in the world as well. So it's kind of like I've seen inside all those and they, and they all come with their challenges. Um, but I think no matter what phase you're at, having that deep, deep why beneath the why is super, super important um, to do the work for. It's worth spending the time in for sure. Yeah, wow. This is, this is really fascinating. I'd love to go a little bit deeper on this process, Jamie, if that's okay with you, because I think, I think you're right. Like, I think people really struggle with that. And um, I think you see oftentimes, like when people don't make it work, it's 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 because that sense of purpose it's that sense of meaning so i'm curious kind of how long ago was this when you kind of you know you said you took you two years until you had this catalyst how long ago was that so 06 and 07 2006 2007 um and then i eventually just decided like I'm going to go for it. And, um, you know, I, it's a funny story, but I was on my honeymoon flight to South Africa and, uh, and wrote the business plan on my honeymoon with my husband, which is by the way, the least, least romantic way to start <laughs> any marriage is to write your business plan on your honeymoon. And then, uh, for anyone listening who runs their, their business or with a, with like a loved one or a family or a partner or friend, it is wild how difficult it is to navigate like all of the blurring of lines in the relationship. But I think when you go into it the first time, you think like, oh, but you trust that person more than anybody and it's just gonna be great. And, and it ended up being great, but really hard. Um, but anyhow, wrote the business plan on our, on our honeymoon flight to South Africa, got back, um, literally quit our jobs. We poured every penny we had into the business, which wasn't much, it was every penny of savings that we had. And I just thought, you know, if we create a product that actually works, like that really truly works, it's just going to sell. Right. And, uh, and I think, <laughs> I think a lot of entrepreneurs have had this experience where you're like, it's so good. Why isn't it selling? <laughs> like, why is everyone saying no? And why is it so difficult? And, you know, it was, uh, uh, 2008, when, um, when we had our first product and, and first couple of products, and I, I believed in them so much. Um, and, you know, I sent them to every retailer, every department store, every beauty retailer, every 
online retailer, QVC, which is a, a live television shopping channel um, in the US that's broadcast to 100 million homes. And I just had this vision, Nathan, like I saw it so clear. Um, the only problem was no one else did. <laughs> and it was like, it is so hard when people that you know, you've put on a pedestal, right? Like a lot of these beauty retailers, I mean, I used to save my waitressing tip money to shop in their stores. And I, I just thought for sure um, they would love this product because it works. And, but they didn't. And every single one of them said no after no after no after no after no. And one thing I learned that I wish I learned this lesson sooner, I would have saved myself so many nights crying myself to sleep. But what I learned, you know, I was trying to do something different, right? I was trying to use, you know, images of real people. I was trying to sort of change the definition of beauty. And, 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 and it wasn't just about the products that worked. It was about sort of the big picture thing. And every single one of them would say, like, that's not going to work. Like, you, they would always tell me, Nathan, um, you need to use images of uh, unattainable aspiration. They'd always say those words, unattainable aspiration. And they would say that women will only buy products from images they can never possibly look like. And I got that that's how it's always been done, but I was trying to do it differently. And the biggest lesson that I wish I had learned sooner is if you are doing something authentic to yourself, which by definition, there's only one of you. So if it's authentic and being done your way, it means it's new, it's novel, it's never been done before. Or if you're doing something crazy, innovative or disruptive or you know, a product that's never been done before, when you're doing something different or authentic to you, don't be surprised <laughs> when you know, even people that tout themselves as visionaries or they're you know, heads of industry or heads of you know, retail or whatever it might be, don't be surprised if, if, if even the experts don't believe in what you're doing, because what I have learned is so many well-intentioned people, really smart people, people that are true, truly just brilliant and believe they are visionaries, they often cannot believe in something unless they have a psychological sort of social proof that it's already been successful in, in their mind, unless they've already seen it successful they have a hard time actually seeing it working and because they've never seen proof of it before. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people don't realize that's how they think. They don't know why they're not believing in something. But what I found was so many people and they were people that, again, well-intentioned and really, really smart, but they're often incapable of seeing something succeeding unless it's already been done. And so for any founder or entrepreneur or person with big goals or dreams or even, you know, talent and art and creations you want to put out in the world, what I've learned is you have to get really good at cheering for yourself along this journey because often people will only cheer for you after you've made it, <laughs> like after you've proven it. And I used to take it so personal and really try to, you know, try to bounce back, try to, try to remember my why, try to get still and hear my own gut that always said to keep going. But it is hard when you get no after no after no. And, you know, 20 no's in, it's like you start to think like, well, maybe this isn't going to work or was my gut wrong? You know what I mean? And, and I think those are the moments when you get still and, you know, some people might pray, some people might meditate, some people might just try to hear what is their gut telling them. But I think when you get still and you listen for the answer, I think your gut is always more powerful than anyone else's advice. Um, no matter who's telling you no, or you're not the right fit or whatever right now. Yeah. So um, I have to ask for you, when, when did you know that it was, it was going to work? Oh. <laughs> well, it was, a, so from the moment we launched it cosmetics, right, this was in our living room couldn't afford to pay ourselves and, you know, all the money had gone into our product. And so uh, <laughs> I remember this is a, a funny story that maybe, maybe uh, someone listening or watching this will, will relate to, but after all of these no's from everyone, I was like, all right, you know what? We're going to go direct to consumer. Like this product is so good and, and we couldn't afford to hire anyone to build our site. And so um, my husband got this big yellow book called HTML for dummies. 
and he he built the whole first site and I remember the day it went live I was like a little like kid on Christmas morning I was so excited because I just knew right you say when do you knew I felt like I just knew the moment our site went live it was going to be huge and everyone would just buy because the product's so good and uh I'll never forget the morning the website went live and I was just, you know, freaking out, so excited. Um, and an hour into it, there were no orders. And then several hours went by, no orders. The end of the first day, no orders. And this went on and on, day after day after day after day. And finally, I said to my husband, which is so easy to do if you work with someone that you have a personal relationship with, um, I was like, it's broken. Like, you did it wrong. Like, there's no way this website's working and we're just getting no orders. Like, the product is too good. There's no way. This went on and on and on. And we were weeks into getting no orders. And then I'll never forget the, the day our very first um, order came in. I was, like, screaming, running around the living room. I was so excited. And, and my husband comes up to me and he goes, that was me. He goes, I placed the order to prove to you our website's not broken. And I was just like, oh. And so it was just like this for a long time. Um, there was crazy moments with investors that I had hoped were gonna be kind of like, you know, the person that was gonna save it all and get us into retailers. And, and I just got some of the most painful no's there. Um, but it was one big moment that happened on QVC um, was the real moment I knew. And this was over three years into the business. Um, but something happened and you know, when you just feel like the stars align or you feel like a congruency with your knowing and what's happening in the universe. And you just feel like, like a God moment or whatever, you, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, you know, after years of QVC saying no, and that's the, the live um, 24 hour shopping channel, they, they broadcast to a hundred million homes and, and they're really large in the US um, in particular and in some other countries around the world as well. But they had said no. Uh, I got their head guy on the phone once after a few years of hearing no. I got him on the phone and, and he, his name's Alan Burke, and he was like, you know, thank you. We've reviewed your product with all the buyers and, and it's unanimous that you're not the right fit for, for QVC or for our customers. So there were a lot of like, you know, not just like, oh, no, not now, but like, no, right? So we've been hearing no for so long. And uh, I was at a beauty trade show demonstrating our product and met one of the QVC hosts and talked to the buyers and making a long story short, but I kind of went for it. You're not supposed to leave your booth, but I kind of went for it and just finally went up to one of the buyers in person and just like pitched the brand and poured my heart out. And I was freaking out. I remember sweat running down my whole thing. Anyways, <laughs> every entrepreneur who's almost broke knows this feeling, but I was just like, you don't want to seem desperate, but you also like don't want to have any regrets. So you just go for it. Poured my heart out to her and we got one shot. We got a yes and we got one big shot on QVC. And not only was this moment about to be the moment I knew this is going to be really big, um, but it's also the moment I learned, you know, one of the most powerful lessons as it pertains to authenticity um, as a founder. And so what happened was we got a yes that they would give us one shot, which was um, a 10 minute segment live on, on their broadcast. And at that point we were doing just two to three orders a day on our website, which did work. <laughs> and, um, but that was all we were doing. And they said in this um, 10 minute window, in order to hit their sales goal, uh, we would need to sell over 6,000 units of our concealer. And uh, we had no money. So, so we started applying for SBA loans. Um, 22 banks said no. The 23rd bank, uh, which was California Bank and Trust, said yes. And they gave us an SBA loan just to cover the QVC purchase order. And right for this one big shot. And then Nathan, I learned it's consignment. It's a consignment deal, which was like, oh, we're not even so so so. Um, if anyone listening that isn't familiar with consignment, what it, what our terms meant were that you know we had to pay for manufacture ship in all over six thousand units of product. But if I went live on the air and nothing sold or just a few sold, 
we had to take it all back um, and we wouldn't be paid for it. And, and by the way, if it was like a big breaking news day or something, um, no one's gonna watch the TV shopping channel and then you're totally screwed. And so there's all these like risk factors, which normally you should never, right? As an entrepreneur, as a founder, you should never accept a purchase order you can't afford to lose, like ever. And, um, but at this point we were sort of out of options and we were most likely not gonna make it anyways. And so we said yes. And in this process, um, we hired third party, a couple of third party consultants that are awesome. They help a lot of people um, sell their products in store and their products on QVC. But here's what happened is they, they all told me the same thing, which was, okay, if you're going to have a chance at succeeding, because most companies that go on QVC, they're not able to hit the sales goals. So they don't come back. <clears throat> they all told me the same thing. If you're going to have your best chance at succeeding, here's what you need to do in your 10 minute segment. We want you, you know, you need to use this type of model which was all flawless skin, kind of like you'd see in beauty ads. Um, and you need to do it this way. And I would say to them, you know, okay, but that's not authentic to like why I created this brand. And I would say like, what if, you know, I put a model in her 70s and then I put another model who's dealing with acne. And then what if I show my own, like I take my makeup off and show my bright red rosacea on national television and, the, and then I prove how the product works. And like they were mortified. You know what I mean? And, and they, they were for me. Like they really wanted me to succeed. But again, they'd only seen one type of way succeed. And so I was in this, big dilemma. And I, I flew out to QVC, which is in the state, uh, the state of Pennsylvania in the United States. And I got in a rental car and I was there a week early and I sat in this rental car, um, praying, crying. Like I felt like I would, I would remember watching the front door of the building and people going in and out all day. And I knew like the next time I walked through those doors, I was either going to be bankrupt <laughs> or like my whole life would be changed, but I didn't know which one it was going to be. And I think, I think everyone can relate to this situation where like I was tempted, if I'm going to be really honest, I, I sat in that car and I was tempted to like, not do it authentically. I'm like, well, maybe I would think things like, well, maybe if I do it their way and it works and then I can make some money, not go bankrupt, then I'll try it my way. Like I had all those thoughts. Um, but I also know you can't fake authenticity. I also know that like there's no way, and this is what a lot of people get wrong in their businesses, there is no way to have a human connection with someone else, like a true connection, unless you show up fully authentically, like for better or worse, there's just no way. And people that even know that forget that your relationship with your customer is the same. It's the same. And I remember sitting in that car going, if I'm truly going to connect with, you know, every person watching at home, like I have to fully show up as my, with my authentic intention for this product. And, you know, I remember thinking, who is my customer? And, and I kept imagining this, this single mom, like folding laundry, who was too busy to remember she was beautiful and that she mattered. And I just had this moment in the car where I was like, you know what? It, I would rather have her turn on her television, even if she's going to give me five seconds of her time. I want her to see me showing women that look like her and calling them beautiful and meaning it. Like, even if she buys nothing, I'd rather stand for that than like sell a whole bunch of products and stand for nothing. And so I knew, I knew what I had to do, but we know what we have to do often. And it's not, it's not the easy thing. It's usually the scary thing um, and the risky thing. And I am, um, remember walking into the, the building and into the studio and um, we were going to get that one shot. And so I walked in and right in the big studio, there's these cameras and the host was there. And then there was a clock that was on the ground that was set at 10 minutes. And then there was a live clock to tell you what was happening in the show. Um, and then Nathan, and I learned that like, okay, it's all on the line, right? I have this 10 minute window. It's everything's on the line. And then I learned you're not guaranteed the 10 minutes. Like if you go live and your clock starts going 
and you're not hitting sales goals. Like you could be a minute in and they cut your time all the way down to like two minutes left. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm not even guaranteed this. And so it was, it was wild. Um, and one of the, one of the scariest and best days of my career and also of my life, I remember the moment the, the clock started and we were like at 9.59, 9.58, 9.50. And I was like, and I was, I was shaking. I was sweating. Like I remember just, yeah, I got on two pairs of Spanx, which wasn't because of how I, it wasn't like I needed to look a certain way. I was trying to make sure sweat did not go through my dress. And I wasn't nervous about TV. I was just like the whole company, like the weight of the whole company um, was like, it felt like it was hanging in that moment. Um, and I remember the moment on, on live television where they brought up my before shot. So it was a bare face before shot where you can see my bright red bumpy rosacea. And I remember walking over to, to all the models and they were every age and skin tone and, and, and skin challenge. And and size and shape and 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 uh, and and then I didn't know how we were doing, but I wasn't cut yet, so I knew that was good. <laughs> and then we got down to the it was like one minute left, and the host was like, "The deep shade's almost gone, the tan shade's almost sold out." And it was literally right at the ten minute mark where this giant sold out sign um, came up across the screen. And this was the moment when you say, "What's the moment you knew?" I remember tears streaming down my face and I remember the producers were worried I was going to faint. I guess new people faint sometimes because of pressure and they cut from my presentation and went to like Dyson vacuum or something. And I remember my husband came running through the double doors of the studio and I was just sobbing and I'm like, real women have spoken. And I remember he's like, he just looked at me and he put his fists up in the air and he's like, we're not going bankrupt. And I was just like, ah! and it was just like this moment where I, it felt like I risked it all. And at the same time, all I did was make a decision from a place of congruency and authenticity. And what I continued to learn is, as we grew and grew and grew, we eventually became the largest beauty brand in, in QVC's history. Uh, and it is to this day. Um, and I was doing over 250 live shows a year myself for, for many years um, and, and, you know, built a team of over a thousand, so I have other, other people going on. And, but, um, but what I learned after seeing tens of thousands of brands come through the doors and meeting their entrepreneurs and their founders and their heads of sales going on the air, most of them don't make it. And, and the one big thing I learned is like, while authenticity alone um, doesn't automatically guarantee success, that inauthenticity guarantees failure. And what I would observe is that the, the very few people that would make it with their brands, they were never the ones that, you know, even necessarily had the best product or the, the, the most money behind their marketing or anything else. It was, it was when the person they had go on air was the same on air as they were in the green room, whether they were extroverted or introverted or, or wild, or it didn't matter. But there is that sort of like congruency and that through line of authenticity that you can't fake and, and people feel it. And so the people that were, were truly authentic and who they were in the green room, but then all of a sudden they're live in front of a hundred million homes and they're the same person, that's who customers would connect with. And for me, that was one of the most powerful lessons because, you know, we're now in a digital world where everyone's worried about how they're showing up in every digital platform and direct to consumer and on social media. and now more than ever, people can get distracted by what everyone else is doing. And the second you start to dilute your own authenticity or your own secret sauce, that's when you're in trouble. Um, and so I think now more than ever, this lesson is so important. Yeah, wow. What an incredible story. Um, I'm lost for words. I have to ask you a few <laughs> things that come through my mind. A lot of questions. Um, and we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have you for a long period of time. So uh, the, fir the first question I had to ask off the back of that story was you talk about the authenticity piece and I know um, obviously like it's clear like a, a strong way that you've, you, you grew in cosmetics was, was through you, your personal brand and really being a spokesperson and the face of the brand. Um. What would you say to founders that perhaps 
do I want to be the face of the brand or perhaps are worried um, around kind of even if, if their face is too strong, they might not be able to sell that company, you know, and then you had an incredible exit. Like what, what's your take there? Uh, that, by the way, no one has ever asked me that question. And that is such a brilliant question because it is so important. Um, I knew exactly what you're saying, Nathan, that like if we were too heavily key person dependent, right, we would never be able to be acquired or, or, or really truly have some, something that was, was sellable or even scalable in a lot of ways. And so two things. The first part of that question, I think it's perfectly fine if you're a founder and you want nothing to do with being the face of the brand. I think it's perfectly fine to find someone who can be if you need that as part of your company. And how you do that. So I did this. I did that in my own company and I did it very differently, actually, than most people do. Um, so I'll share that piece in a moment. If you're like a founder, that's like, how do I find you know, someone who's the perfect face for the brand. Um, but I do think you can do it that way. Find someone else and have it be fully authentic and have it be really powerful. You can find more than one person also. Um, I knew early on, and this is a lot, this is a big blind spot for so many founders, which I am just, I'm fired up that you asked that question and realizing no one's ever asked that question. Um, this is such a big blind spot for founders because they don't realize their business is them, <laughs> which is not a business, but you know what I mean? But yet they're burnt out. A lot of times when your business is all you, you're burnt out, all of the things, right? And, and so, um, and, and when you're having great success, especially success masks a whole lot of problems and a whole lot of inefficiencies, right? And key person dependency is one of those. And so early on, um, there were a couple things that, that we did. Um, and one of them was realized really quickly, like, oh, you know, cause, cause after the moment we just talked about when, when we had the big sellout of everything and all the stuff, you know, that, that one airing turned into five that year, 101 the next year, and eventually 250 live shows a year. There's only 365 days a year. That's a whole lot of time. And what was tricky was, and I was so burnt out by the way, doing hundred hour weeks plus like trying to do everything else, right? So we were scaling and even though we were hiring rapidly, we were trying to, you know, preserve our culture as we were hiring, I was still trying to myself sign off on every, every element of copy, write every story, every, every product name, create, you know, all the stuff, like a billion moving parts, not to mention all the other departments we were building out. Um, so that's all going on. I was burnt out for a number of years Yet what was happening was QVC, um, who was our biggest channel for a long time, um, you know, they have a history of where when the founder steps off there and someone else goes on, that other person doesn't hit numbers. And all of a sudden the brand starts going down. So they did not want me to have anyone else go on. So there was this big pressure for a long time where we were dependent on them right? So we had a business for a number, for, for a few years that was key person dependent on me going on air all the time, but then it was key channel dependent <laughs> on QVC. So it was a double, double negative in terms of uh, a healthy business. And so the good thing is, you know, we identify that really early and, and, you know, after, you know, and it wasn't for lack of trying, everyone else just said no forever. But eventually all of our success on QVC, other channels started wanting us, all of the department stores, all the beauty retailers. And I did an infomercial that aired in, in the United States and it was on while I was sleeping. So I was like, okay, we're selling product while I'm sleeping. This is great. So we had all these moving parts, um, but we still had the problem that it was key person dependent on me. So. What I did, which was, I think, very different than what most people would do, because um, I've seen a lot of other founders, in the, the, like especially on QVC, they'll hire someone to take over their role, but they'll hire someone that is like a master at sales, or they come from, they poach them from another company because they're a superstar there, or whatever it might be. With that idea that you cannot fake authenticity and that customers are smart, I did it totally different. I took three people 
inside my organization who their lives were authentically changed by the product. Like, like full evangelists, but they'll tell their neighbor at the coffee shop. <laughs> like, like, but their lives were authentically changed by the product. I took three people internally and I taught those people who had the authenticity piece, I taught them the TV and the sales piece. And it took a number of years. They, they started traveling to all my shows. Um, we were on in Canada as well in the shopping channel there and they would go to my US shows. And for three years, they shadowed me at every show as I taught them all of it, started putting them on air in Canada where the, the, um, the sales goals were lower. Like you wouldn't get kicked off right away. <laughs> if you missed a, you know, in the U S you get kicked off right away. Um, and then eventually those three women, uh, took over, uh, the entire QVC business for me. And I had my head of marketing doing press for the brand instead of me for a while. And basically I did everything I could. This is the big takeaway for, for every founder. This intuitively feels scary, but when you can figure out how to replace yourself in every part of what you do the best you can, that's the healthiest your business will be. That's the most sellable your business will be. And you know, you have to take your ego out of it. <laughs> A lot of people are like, I am not replaceable, <laughs> which is true for every founder. You really can't fully replace you. But the more you can show that there is no key person dependency, because here's the thing, Nathan, you know, we met with L'Oreal for, for three years and they said, no, we met with other people and they thought our business was too key person dependent. A lot of times that's the reason you won't ever be able to get past, you know, to get to the exit. And, um, and so we were able to solve that and, and able to show that the best we could, I had become as irrelevant as possible <laughs> um, to the business and that we had something that was scalable. So. Yeah, wow. That was awesome. Really, really incredible insight. So look, as I said, Jamie, this has been an incredible interview. I'm conscious of your time. A uh, couple more questions we have to work towards wrapping up. I'd love to talk about the sale because um, you said uh, – you know, you'd, you'd met with L'Oreal three times. So how long did it take? So you started, you launched, was it 2009 on QVC, 2008? Uh, 2010 on QVC. Yeah, two, that September of 2010. September 10th, I think, to September 2010. Though. Um, and uh, we were acquired um, by L'Oreal uh, in 2016. Um, so they paid $1.2 billion cash. Uh, but that's not, that wasn't the first offer. <laughs> was, um, how it happened, you know, I, I just, so the real truth is there were so many things I think that I did wrong growing the business, so many things that thankfully I did right. And one of the things I was never able to truly figure out for myself was how to, um, how to not become totally burnt out and like like meaning i drove everything so hard including myself i um was so burnt out for a number of years i actually not to end the interview on a down note but i'm just going to keep it so real because i have so much respect for every founder and every person with big dreams on their heart and i just if sharing this helps someone feel less alone then it's worth it but the truth was i think i i, I know i became completely addicted to work and my husband did as well. And so we were in this spot where all of a sudden we had all of this amazing growth. We were, you know, we had it was 7 million paying customers in the U.S. I mean, everything was spreading. It was beautiful. Our team was so much smarter than I am. It was like all of these parts were so incredible from the outside. But on the inside, I knew I was burnt out. I knew that, and my husband was too. We were both doing 100-hour weeks. I felt I was living by this feeling of I've got to strike while the iron's hot, almost like a version of imposter syndrome where I couldn't believe this was happening to me. Like, like after so much rejection for so many years, like, like processing that all the success was happening. I was like, Oh, well, maybe it's going to come crashing down at any second. So I've got to keep striking while the iron's hot. And I drove myself so hard and was so burnt out and i there is a moment that i remember where you know my husband had called i looked at my cell phone and i in in that moment when i looked at his name on my phone i equated it automatically as a work call 
And I had realized that <laughs> everything in my life revolved around work. And while I, I hope and believe I was uh, really good at, at building a business and, and leading a team and all of this and loving our customers, obsessing about our customers, I also realized I was not a good steward of health or of a marriage or a body or any of those things. And so in this moment of realizing like, oh, we're super addicted to work. Um, I think if I continue to live this way forever, I will regret it and miss my whole life. <laughs> and so we were considering, do we go public? But in knowing that all of my friends who have gone public say like, oh, it's even more work. <laughs> like now you have your, you know, your earnings calls and you have everyone shorting your stuff, you have all this stuff going on. And so I was like, okay, I think we need to partner, um, you know, be acquired or, or partner because we were starting to launch internationally. We had launched into Sephora and Southeast Asia and Australia and, um, and Thailand. And we were, we were launching from our team trying to do it everywhere, which I realized like, okay, we can figure this out, but at a much slower pace than if we partner with someone like L'Oreal that has teams on the ground in over a hundred countries. So, you know, we'd started taking exploratory meetings. Uh, L'Oreal reached out first, actually. Oh no, that's not true. I sent, I sent their head of US um, luxury uh, a big product basket. So I'd heard her give a talk. I was kind of ballsy this way. I don't know if I can use that word on your show, but of course. you just got to go for it. Even if you risk looking like silly or whatever, but I remember sending the head of US at L'Oreal years before we met. I sent her, a, a, I'd heard her give a talk where she listed her top 10 favorite products of all time. And I sent her a note saying like, I loved your talk. The only problem was it cosmetics wasn't on your list. And I know if you actually tried it cosmetics, it would be on your top 10 list. And so I wrote this whole thing and sent her a package and I didn't know if she ever got it. Well then, uh, fast forward, it must have been a year or so, she reached out for a meeting. And I was like, oh. so right away I thought L'Oreal wants to buy us, like right away. Um, but then I didn't realize it would be three years of, of the meetings uh, escalating to Paris and, and everyone involved and, and, and they always ended in a no and not the right fit. And so we did lots of different meetings. Um, and then eventually um, we got really far along um, in, in the process in the acquisition process with L'Oreal and, uh, and they made us an offer for the first time. And, um, it was wild because after years of them saying no, they made us this amazing offer that like, when I saw it, I mean, I couldn't even fathom when I was a waitressing at Denny's, I couldn't have even imagined an offer like that. But what happened that was so serendipitous and grace filled for us is the moment they finally made an offer something was happening in the beauty space where another brand was up for sale and everybody that didn't get that brand came after us so all of a sudden we had all these other inbound offers coming and this was all so so we brought on goldman sachs and we actually did a process and and for l'oreal's initial offer we said no so and and by the way I didn't even know I knew how to say the word no. I only knew how to hear the word no. Um, but we said no. And, and, and then, because we were getting other offers that were larger. And so then they came back with, with a way bigger offer um, that we felt really beyond amazing about. And, um, and we said yes. And so it was 2016 um, when we, so they bought 100% of little company I started in my living room. Um, and it was, it was wild. It was, um, I, I, so it was, they paid $1.2 billion cash. They made me the first woman to hold a CEO title of a brand in their 107 year history at the time. And um, I gave them my word. I didn't have anything tying me to this uh, financially, but I gave them my word I would stay on for three years. Um, and I kept, by the way, even after all this, I kept working 100 hour weeks. Like it was just like my nature. Like I just, um, but we doubled the size of the business the first two years post acquisition. Um, and then at the third, at the three year mark, um, I made the decision because it's like such a well oiled machine now. You know what I mean? Like, um, and I made the decision to write my first ever book called Believe It and just try to, it's really stories about how to go from underestimated to unstoppable. And I'm kind of in this place now where I'm so grateful to be talking with you because I think when, I think when we can use all of the 
challenges and struggles and real stories and learnings and lessons we've been through uh, to hopefully save someone else at least one night crying themselves to sleep or, or money or time. I think that's when it becomes even more fulfilling and purposeful that, that we've had the kind of journeys, even, even not just the ups, but also the downs. It makes them so much more purposeful. And so, so I'm honored to, to be here with you and, and sharing all of this today. So. Yeah, wow. What an incredible story. Um, well, look, super conscious of your time. We have to work towards wrapping up. I could talk to you all day. Uh, a couple of last questions. We, we call it the hot seat round. If you could go back to your first day in business um, and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be and why? Listen to that knowing inside over all the no's. Your knowing is more powerful than any no that you'll get. If you could have dinner with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Well, I've had lunch with her, but I would still say I would have dinner with Oprah. And the reason I say that, and she's a brilliant entrepreneur, but I believe she is the queen of authenticity. And I think she disrupted an entire industry by, through that. I think that she is someone that has mastered um, all the dimensions um, of, of life in the sense of spiritual, of service, of contribution. Um, and she, she's learned how to not be a people pleaser, which for women is very tough. Um, so I, I would say Oprah for sure. Awesome. What's one thing you wish people asked you more? You want to dance? <laughs> I love dancing. I feel like, by the way, right before our interview, because it's been like a long day of stuff, really fun stuff but like I danced right before we started this because I'm like I if someone is going to bless us you and me with their precious time I want to bring the energy I want to bring the the contribution and so I think I think dancing is under underappreciated and I'm not a great dancer I just love it and I think like if you've ever been to a party I think the best dancer is always the one who just commits like fully commits <laughs> so I would say Will you dance? Love it. Uh, last question. What's one thing you've learned today? One thing I've learned today is how much value you add to your readers and listeners. I already knew that, but to experience it with you live, um, it was very cool. Yeah. It's very rare that I have someone ask questions I've never been asked before. And I think that those kind of questions are, are so much are so valuable to people. I, I bet you, Nathan, and maybe someone will write in and share this, but I bet you there's someone that didn't realize right now that they need to figure out how to not be key person dependent on themselves and their business. Um, and this takes years sometimes to, to set into motion. But I think, yeah, that's, I already knew this, but then I learned it in real time how, how much value you add and everything you guys are doing at Founders. So. Oh, you're far too kind. Thank you. Um, look, I went off script. I, I, I had a list of questions, but I was just so kind of enamored and captured by your story, your storytelling. I, I just had to keep going, like what my gut was telling me because, I yeah, so this was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.